Thanks a lot. Uh, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Sagar. I'm a senior geospatial data scientist at Orbica. Again, not a GS person, so don't ask me a GS question at the end, please. <laughs> Mainly on data science <laughs> side. So join Orbica six years ago and mainly integrating geospatial with AI technologies. So what sort of risk associated with those kind of these two technologies when we have it and how we can overcome the risk and what sort of like problem we face so far and how we tackle those problems. So that's something I'm going to share in this presentation uh, on the geospatial side, the problem that we have it and the AI side as well. So something to cover in the presentation, which is mainly the evolution of the tree based model. So most of you guys know that like the vegetation and the trees are becoming part of our life and we all the people want to monitor it, maintain it, understand the change. So mainly just like what is the evolution look like for the geo AI models on the tree side, then the current challenge is and then after talk more about the NZ wide model. So like when you create a country wide model, what things you need to understand, what things are a bottleneck and what things you can create a problem for the geospatial people and for the AI people. So at the end, I will just share a couple of the thoughts and some sort of like the hard way we learn how we tackle that kind of problem when we build a country wide model for the New Zealand. And in the end, if we get a time, we just jump to the tool and give you the, some live tree detection demonstration at the end. So just want to start something with Orbika. So again, Orbika started 2017. Uh, my boss is here, Kurt Jennison. Uh, the main focus is geospatial consultancy. So that's something that we've been focused in last five years. Uh, something last year, we started building a geospatial platform. So again, the main purpose for this platform is like, how can we bring a non-GIS person to the GIS industry, like data scientists or data analysts, to apply a geospatial AI, uh, and then how, vice versa, how can we bring the geospatial people into AI space, how we can create a one platform that can utilize by these two kind of personas, uh, and that's something that we started building and we released this year as well. Uh, again, just, just want to touch base on some of the evolution of the different source of imagery. So again, inside the GIS data sets, when I uh, actually fall in this industry five years ago, I thought there are only satellite imagery over there, not the aerial, not the drones. But then when I go to the satellite, then I found there are more band inside the satellite imagery. So as a data scientist, like they always think about computer vision, which is RGB three band only. But when you just come into the GIS industry, you know there are uh, pixels beyond the RGB, like vegetation uh, indices near infrared and other stuff. And why those pixels and the bands are in, uh, important to understand the different uh, species detection at the end. So the Earth observation like age is here and now it's changing over time. Most of you guys know the satellites are coming across like every year, thousands of satellites are coming and they, they want to monitor the planet, how the planet is changing and how can we use geospatial tools and the AI tools to understand how the planet is evolving over time. And then a couple of the uh, sort of like uh, vegetation uh, importance, like why we want to manage, uh, monitor the vegetation and why it's a key part of the planet. So some of the use cases like a disaster response, wildfire monitoring, uh, land use planning, uh, change detection. So there are like lots of different use cases to monitor a vegetation, a tree species and how they are changing over time. So like in this pre presentation, like just mainly touch base on three different kind of models that we've been developing and working uh, in last five years and just want to share uh, the problems and the learnings associated with these models and what things like make you fall and what things you can just uh, uh, just uh, just make sure that you won't go in that direction if you are developing a countrywide model at the end. So just want to start with the aerial imagery. So again, like uh, for the aerial imagery, like uh, the model that we've been developing, which is mainly focusing on two sort of like aerial imagery. Uh, for the city of Christchurch and the Canterbury area. So again, the goal is like, how can we create a model who can detect the canopy cover, which is 1.5 meters square wide, and the height is 3.5 meter uh, from the ground for the urban area. And for the rural area, another thing is like, how can we detect the vegetations, which is creating overhead to the power lines or a power pole or something like that. So like if they want to manage or they want to understand like the risk associated for the power falling over, like what is the look, uh, what that risk look like for the tree canopy side. So for this, like for this kind of project, like we do get two sort of imagery. Again, dealing with the aerial imagery is always good. Like the pixels are really nice. The resolution is really nice. But when you get the imagery for the entire Canterbury or the Christchurch, now the biggest problem start, how you manage it. 
what you're going to do, how much training data you need, how you select the right tiles. So again, like to, uh, to understand the entire pipe, like we do learn the different ways, like we don't want to create the model at the end, which is more biased on the human side. So we keep iterating with the different SMEs and the forestry provider and the client to understand that like what land is different, what pixel is different, and how we can create a good training data sets and the validation data set to actually validate a model that's actually doing the thing at the end. So on, on my right, like there are some sort of high level architecture that we have. So again, in AI, we have training, testing, pass to the model, the model learns based on the RGB, shape, area, texture, edge feature, nearest neighborhood pixel. So that's some sort of like algorithm, the CNNs are working like that. And it's going from like uh, sort of like a high level to low level pixel classification at the end and it will create the model at the end. So uh, like, so based on this kind of example, like we still utilize the power of GIS. So that's something is really important as a data scientist I found is if I work with the GIS people to understand how the land is changing, how the elevation is changing, how the species is changing, and what sort of like the existing layer I can use to find out, create a good amount of training data sets that can help my model to understand, learn the different part of the trees happening in urban areas and the rural areas. And even that's coming from seven and a half centimeter to 30 centimeter. So when you change the resolution, like the models will change over time. So to understand that like what's important for the urban area, what's important for the rural area, what's the use case look like? And based on this use case, we train a model uh, who can give us like 94% accuracy for the urban area, which is the area of intersection. So that's something like the polygon uh, level accuracy that we have. And for the rural area, we got 89% accuracy. So we build a model, that's fine. Now the model is spitting out 5 million trees for urban area and 50 million trees for the rural areas. So we give that file to the GIS people and there's like, man, we cannot handle it. We cannot dissolve it. We cannot merge the geometry. It's a lots of geometry to handle. How are we gonna handle this kind of stuff? And, and then it's another level of complexity came is like, you have a model, that's great. The model is splitting the results, but how are you gonna manage the results? How are you gonna present the results? How are you gonna send the results to your client? If you send a shape file or geo package, most of the, like, uh, the softwares will fail if you load a 50 million geometries uh, in a particular like open source tool. And so that's how like we came to the another problem that what is the best way to process, manage such a large geometry because like the results coming from the AI models are not always accurate. They have some sort of false positives, false negatives, uh, some sort of age issue, tiling issue. So we need to make sure that like at the end we apply a nice GIS post-processing techniques to clean the results and make the results nicer before del delivering to the client. Uh, so yeah, that's something I will talk in a minute about the post-processing side. But like the way I'm just talking more about the life cycle of data scientists. So once they get the training data, now the goal is like how many models he gonna spin, how they gonna validate the model, how many time he needs to go and iterate the model and understand uh, over like uh, if it is like a false negative, false positives, it's like under uh, identify, over identify. So all sort of thing that he has to follow and that's something I just men uh, mentioned, the high level architectures and the models that I use so far. So find, and then the data scientists find a model which is 94% accurate. That's looking great on a number. Now let's send the results to the client. Let's get their feedback. So we, we ran the model, we, uh, we send to the client, and then clients say the model is uh, under predicting on some of the areas and over predicting on some of the areas. Now the model is not that much ready, so the client can able to adopt and calculate the different things. So the client says that like, can you make another version of this model where uh, you can do some sort of improvements on the model? So that's something on light, last slide I added, like the improvements on false positive, false negative. So just want to manage the ratio and that's how the data scientists will evolve and then just train another model that meet the uh, accuracy for the client then, which is like 88% at the end for this particular area. And that's some of the like output I showed here, which is uh, on the urban area. So like that's something, a heat, heat map uh, with, with the LiDAR information to understand the height of the tree. So the one of the goal of this project is like, just find out the trees uh, in city of Christchurch, which is like 3.5 meter wide, and uh, sorry, which is like 1.5 meter uh, wide and then 3.5 meter uh, height on that side. Uh, 
uh, again, one of the example with the uh, uh, like a ruler area. So like, again, the ruler area for for this kind of example, like we need to understand how the power lines is approaching the trees. And if we just add the LiDAR information, if we calculate the tree height, what are the power lines are touching the trees, which is above uh, 20 meter. So like some of the things I highlight here. So all of these trees are enroaching the power line and that might be overhead for the tree to the power line. And that's something that they need to fix it or prune it or maintain it to able to uh, manage the power cut. And then the model for the ruler side, like those some of the iteration that we went through and we got 89% accuracy on that side as well. So, uh, and then like once we have the model, uh, we still need to do some sort of like a human validation that that's we call it like a model validation or human in the loop process. So where we give a model to some non AI person who does not know how to train the model or where the training data look like, because we don't want to validate the model on the training data, we want to validate the model on the testing areas. So what that person is doing is like, it just do some sort of like a thousand point random sampling. So it just plot the thousand point onto the map, have a tree, like have a AI results, have a human input on that, and then just doing the comparison that how many time, for that particular point, how many time AI say it's a tree and the human say it's a tree. If the count is matching, then yes, if not, then it's like a negative count. So that's how like we are doing a, some sort of random sampling to make sure the models are accurate that we are producing at the end. Uh, so that's how we ended up in the aerial imagery space. Uh, now just want to touch base on the drone side, which is like, uh, that's fine. Like we have an aerial imagery, RGB, seven and a half, 30 centimeter, that's fine. Now we get the drone imagery. So how does the model work and what are the challenges look like from the drone images and how can we overcome that kind of challenges? So again, like for, for the drone images, like again, the main point for the drone images for us is like how can we detect the species for the trees, like conifers, and even how can we detect further more level of detail inside the conifer, like what are the species of the conifer look like, which is like pine, radiata, contorta, Douglas worm. Uh, excuse me, yeah, so that's something that we want to identify from the AI models. So that's why we need a near infrared signature to understand that like how the species is absorbing the water. And based on this water, like uh, uh, we can classify that it is a Douglas form of pine radiata or uh, contorta or on the conifer space. So again, like uh, the training data part is super important. We do have a, some sort of like bullet point whenever we come, we came a new project. Uh, uh, we just need to find out like all sort of like the focus uh, areas and the GIS knowledge to understand the uh, creating the right amount of training data sets and creating the right model. And we do ver verify this training data set with the client or we work with the client to create a training data set because that's super important for any AI project. Uh, and as long as we verify uh, that training data set, then the data scientist is ready to use this data to train and build and tune the different models at the end. So the outcome of this project is like sort of a heat map that you can see on that side, which is the conifer density map. So they want to understand that like which area uh, the higher number of conifers are there. And if they want to spray a chemical, uh, how like how they can spray it and which area has the bigger uh, coverage of the conifers. And then on, on, the, on the below side, like there are some sort of species information. So that's something that we classify at the species level by the each color coded species, which is contour, Douglas firm, and radiata. And we got 94% accuracy on the conifer side uh, and the species accuracy, which is 85% at the end. Uh, now moving to the satellite. So we got aerial, we got drone. Now the bigger picture is the satellite. So how can we build a model from freely available Sentinel-2 data sets and what sort of risk and the problem look like when we want to create the model uh, for the countrywide. So again, Sentinel-2, uh, uh, which is like uh, revisit time is like every 10 days for New Zealand. So you will get a new image uh, for every 10 days from the, uh, for the entire New Zealand that's like ready to use to process any kind of information you want to process at the end. So what we did in this project, which is like we uh, procure all these Sentinel-2 data sets stored inside our data cube because like New Zealand, we don't have a data cube product like Australia, they have a digital earth. Australia and then Africa, they have a digital earth Africa, something like that. So in New Zealand, we don't have a, any data cube product. So that's something that we build it uh, and we uh, create analysis ready medians, a cloud free medians for 2019 to 2023. And that's something that we build and create inside the S3 bucket, uh, which is ready to use for the different purposes. So as long as we get the imagery, now the main problem is uh, uh, like how can we 
have a 300 GB of imagery sitting inside the S3, how can we digitize the data? It's a 10 meter resolution, so it will be really hard to determine the saddle belt, hedgerows, native forest, exotic forest. So what sort of like challenges look like for this one? And even like New Zealand have a lots of number of species and then it's from North Island to South Island. So how we create a model that work across uh, the entire New Zealand and which give you the different information at the end. So again, like we mainly follow the GIS knowledge on that side and then we have a couple of like high low elevation forestry vegetation area, shelter belts are always hard, we know that. So we make sure that like we cover more example of shelter belts as a part of the training. Uh, and then we use like 0.097% of the training data for the entire New Zealand. And then we create a model, we validate the model and we got like around 86% F1 score and then 79% accuracy at the species level from Sentinel-2. And, and then uh, here is the, some of the output is on your uh, right hand side. So again, like on talking more on the AI side, which is like creating a model for countrywide, how many time you need to validate the model, how many time you need to send the results to the client or SMEs uh, to understand that the actual model that you are producing, which is working for entire New Zealand, uh, not only some of the forestry block or not only some of the areas. So that's something that we do have to do a couple of iterations. And what we found at the end is like shelter belts are really hard to understand, like detect from the AI side as an individual species. So we just merge exotic and shelter belt into one class. And then we have a native forest. So we created at the end a model which is like a native versus exotic kind of model. Uh, the shelter belts are still coming uh, as a part of exotic, but that's something help AI model to bump up the accuracy and then we got like 86% accuracy for that uh, period. And then you can see on my right there are like uh, more than tiny, tiny, uh, like thousand shelter bells detected for the Rolleston area in Christchurch, which is like a less than 20 pixels. So the way like we digitize the data, the way we use the training data, which is like very specific and we know that shelter bells and hedgerows are a linear kind of like pattern. and when you pass those kind of information like AI models are looking for the size, size shape, uh, color, and then what's a surrounding pixel. So that's something that we are 100% sure that like if we pass a good amount of training data as a central bed, then we can able to create a model from 10 meter resolution to detect uh, all the central beds and exotic as a one class. Uh, so now and then like for the entire country, uh, we like we train on 0.1% of the total area to train the model and we just ran the model for the entire New Zealand uh, area which is took, which took around like 15 hours of runtime on the GPUs which is uh, uh, two Titan V's that we have and then the geometry is coming from the AI model which is like uh, 500,000 shelter bit exotic and then uh, I think like 1 million polygon for the native so when we get the AI results, uh, you can see on the left there are a tile issue like that. So that's the tile issue that's coming from the AI model because like uh, you cannot pass a full image to the AI model. The full image is like a bigger image uh, based on the GPU size and the GPU capability you have. You have to slice and dice the image into 512 by 512 or 256 by 256. So pass to the model, get the results, convert raster into vectors, merge the vectors and create a countrywide vector. And once you have a countrywide vector on your left, now you found that in this vector, there are lots of things which is noise. There are lots of things which is a tileage. There are lots of things which is a false positive. And there are smaller, smaller like vertices and indices on top of that. So we don't want to deliver that results to the, more, uh, to the client straight away. Uh, that's why we need a really good post-processing power to remove, process these kind of data sets at the end. Yep, so like we apply everything into PostgreSDB inside the Postgres database and then we uh, did, did the spatial indexing, we did the dissolve buffer and then we reduced the time from 15 hours to the three hours inside the database with the spatial index and then that's the results that we have. Uh, just finally just want to touch base on three comparison that I just added. So what the learning and what sort of things I found at the end which is like if you are creating a countrywide model, uh, if you want like, uh, if you have a aerial imagery, that's fine. But again, the resolution is not con consistent for the aerial imagery. 
uh, it's a free little cost uh, from the lens. Like if we can just get, uh, get for the full uh, CD, then it's fine. Uh, and then like uh, some of the like pros are it's like standard everywhere. So the model that you train, uh, make sure that the model work with the like North Highland area as well because like the imagery has a very specific standard across the 8-bit imagery, the angle, size, and the height as well. Uh, some of the challenges which is, uh, which is on the uh, aerial side, which are the like uh, frequency, then not full coverage, different resolution, and the RGB only. Uh, then like if you want to go and do the species detection model, then you can go with the drone. But again, drone is like always hard to capture the imagery. There are lots of different like uh, specification that you need to maintain, like the height trees, like, like the height of the drones, the overlapping pixels, uh, uh, and then uh, even the different resolutions. And then uh, you can get 85% accuracy on the species side on the drone, and then now you have a satellite at the end where you can get a really good model out of that. But again, it depends on the resolution, which is 10 meter. Uh, and then some of the challenges, which is the transfer learning from the model, cloud cover, orbital issue from the Sentinel-2, and then there is not NZ-wide data queue products out there, so you need to pull the data from ESA-2, you need to mosaic it, you need to find the cloud-free median before doing actual AI work, so you are spending more time on the geospatial analysis rather than AI stuff. Uh, some of the things that I learned so far, so some of the models, open source model and the techniques, so again, like a recent model came out from Meta AI. If you guys know more about the segment anything model, so that model is trained from a computer vision industry for RGB imagery only, but that model can apply onto the geospatial data side as well, as long as it's matching red, green, blue channel. Uh, it's not more than, it's not beyond that RGB, but like the recent model that developed by IBM and NASA, which is uh, the Prithvi 100 million model, which model has a capability to detect like four kind of stuff, which is the flood detection, uh, water detection, then land cover classification, burn scar, and there is a one more model inside that. So that model, it just recently came out, I think last month, uh, which is trained from Sentinel-2 data sets, worldwide uh, imagery, uh, and that's like a one of the first geospatial, uh, geospatial foundational model for the AI, uh, and that's something that the people are leveraging that model to do fine tune and build a countrywide model in the future if required. Then uh, some of the really good like satellite deep learning libraries over there, uh, some CNN Sentinel-2 architecture, I will share the slide after that as well, uh, and then some of the technology that we use uh, to build the model as well. Uh, just like, just want to, yeah, sure. Uh, so just want to add like one thing which is like some sort of like validation tool, why it is important, because like when you develop an AI model, how, like again you need to go forth and back with the client because it's the client who understand their problem, who understand what's the accuracy is like important or uh, like enough for their problem. So you need to go forth and back with the client, you need to share the data, you need to get the feedback from the data, you need to understand the false positive, false negative, how wide, how small the tree canopy cover. So like having a, some sort of validation tool that we call it like human in the loop will definitely help us a lot to make this process faster with the client. Uh, and then just uh, give them a permission to modify and give us some sort of examples as a training data to use uh, to train and retrain the model in the future. So some sort of training data tool and some of the features that we have here and then something uh, that we've been developing which is like a GOI feature extraction tool so we, we, you can like just bring all the open source and the custom model. Uh, in the in the Orbica platform and then you can just fine tune and you can run the model on the smaller area and get the results as well. Uh, I think yeah. that's it, yeah, sorry. Pretty sharp, excellent, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Um, a fantastic uh, presentation, that was really interesting and something that I'm personally very interested in. Um, I, at the, in one of your early slides, I uh, had uh, one of the data inputs that uh, was provided was the lens imagery service and also the lens li LIDAR hmm. um, layers, uh, which is stuff that I've worked quite a lot on. I was wondering if you guys are in, have plans to integrate that more into your AI modeling, both in the context of a LIDAR specific model where uh, classification is um, a big area that would benefit a lot from AI and also integration of uh, 
RGB imagery and or hyperspectral imagery and LiDAR in a multimodal model, especially for stuff like forest classification where the intracanopy LiDAR returns are very helpful for creating a statistical model of different um, forest species? Uh, yeah, absolutely, 100%. So again, like having a LiDAR is another band that will definitely help CNN and the models to <coughs> understand that species, it's not like a building because like if we are looking for a trees, then we can just even specify and even digitize a trees which is like 10 meter high and that become a part of the training with the RGB and the LiDAR information and that will definitely help AI model to better classify and give you a tree canopy cover or like what what's happening is like you always miss the cone of the tree because you won't get the full coverage of the LiDAR quality or something like that. But if you have a LiDAR as another like input layer for your CNN models, then it will definitely help. And that's something that we are looking into that and we are planning because like when you add more band, the model become more complex and we need to understand that like, is it really worth to get 1% accuracy or 85% accuracy is good enough for the client. So it's like always asking the, those questions to the client, like what's 86%, 85%, 86% will take four months, 85% will take two months. So what you want at the end, yeah. Uh, just on your species um, differentiation accuracy, was that was that just within those broad categories of native and exotic, as opposed to actual species definition? For uh, for the Sentinel two, from the Sentinel two, uh, from any of any of the sources. Yeah, so from the Sentinel two, the native exotic is for the entire New Zealand. But for the drone, the species which is like the conifer species, which is for that particular area, uh, which is like in the South Highland that we use to train and test the model. Yeah, yeah, but was that um, accuracy of um, delineating the species, like um, Pinus radiata versus? Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's so that's yeah. So that's correct. Yeah. So that's the accuracy, like eighty-five or eighty-six percent. Uh, that's like delineating the species actually. Uh, it's like Contorta, Pine radiata, and then Douglas form. So they both like it's around eighty-two, eighty-three, the individual species level accuracy, but the average is eighty-five percent. And was that including native species as well? Uh, so for the native species, I I do have another model, that's Sentinel-2, uh, which is uh, like if I just go back on the native species. Yep, so that from the like native species, that's the 80% accuracy uh, for the native species. And the one that I mentioned, which is the conifer species, which is 85% accuracy to get the living or dead conifers, or even just going to classify into pine radiata, Douglas form or contorta. That's from drone. Okay. Yeah, and the other one is from satellite, Sentinel-2. Uh, I'm skeptical, but uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I'd be keen to talk more about yeah, um, what, what yeah, that actually perfect. means. Yeah, perfect, yeah. Do you have any of the Roy Afton data that yeah. you want to <laughs> Okay, we'll wrap that up. Thanks again.